Hey, 42 here. Of all the peculiar places we've perused on this channel, this is quite possibly the least impressive. At least on the surface. I mean, it's a field. But believe me, this is no ordinary patch of farmland. Take that odd little copse of trees, for example. Isn't it strange that the farmer never bothered to clear it? You'd think it would make working the field easier and increase planting area. But it turns out the farmer never touches that particular bit of land. In fact, he doesn't even own it. This specific circle of conspicuous conifers in the centre of a North Carolina field was quietly bought by the United States Army in 1961. Which begs the question, why did the most powerful military on Earth buy a random patch of turf? Well, it wasn't the land itself the army was interested in, but what lay beneath. You see, this seemingly nondescript field in North Carolina hides a terrible secret. A secret that, just over 60 years ago, almost murdered tens of thousands of innocent Americans as they slept. This is the story of the Goldsboro Incident, the scariest close shave in history. I've always found maintaining my weight to be a bit of an up and down experience. I eat a pretty healthy diet at home, but whenever I travel, I tend to eat really bad and I always return a bit heavier and more sluggish than before. So I took the free 30 second Noom quiz. The link's in the description, by the way, or you can go to noom.com 42. And ever since, things have turned a corner for me. What I love about Noom is that it focuses on maintaining your health without depriving yourself of treats and everyone's popular favourites like pasta, pizza, etc. Every morning I make sure to spend just five minutes doing my daily Noom lesson, which over time has actually changed my psychology around food and my attitude towards when I eat, how much I eat and my choices. I quickly discovered after only a couple of days of using Noom that I was having way too much for breakfast. Using Noom's food logger, I realised that most days I was consuming up to 800 calories for breakfast alone. With Noom, I've been able to reduce that to about 400 to 500 calories, which enables me to maintain my weight so much easier. I've just, for example, cut my granola serving in half and replaced it with a handful of blueberries, which makes it almost 300 calories less. There have been so many little tweaks like that for me that have transformed the way I eat. Because Noom isn't a diet, it's a positive lifestyle overhaul based on proven behavioural psychology techniques. So take your free 30 second quiz today at noom.com 42 or click the link in the description below to get started now. Thanks to Noom for sponsoring this video. Just before midnight on the 23rd of January 1961, three days after JFK was sworn in as president, a B-52 Stratofortress strategic bomber was docking with a refueling plane somewhere over Goldsboro, North Carolina. Mid-air refueling is a dangerous business, but these pilots were pros, so there was no problem. Until there was a problem. The crew on the refueling tanker noticed that the B-52 was leaking fuel from one of its wings. The operation was aborted immediately, and the bomber's pilot was advised to land at a nearby airbase post-haste. The trouble was, the B-52 was too heavy to land safely. It's a little known fact outside of aviation circles that most planes take off significantly heavier than they're safely rated to land, thanks to the extra weight of a full tank of fuel. The B-52 was no exception. It's a colossal craft, capable of holding up to 150,000 kilograms of jet fuel. That's about 22 hefty African bull elephants which is the Civil Aviation Authority's official yardstick for jet fuel, I promise. Anyway, the plane was still laden with fuel, so the pilot flew a holding pattern to burn some off before landing. But as the seconds slipped away, so did the oil. Every minute, thousands of litres fell into the soil. What initially appeared to be a minor operational issue was now a full-scale emergency. The pilot tried to land fervently, but the plane was damaged irreversibly. It was going down, and there was nothing anybody could do to stop it. Losing any aircraft is a big deal, but losing this particular B-52 was a potential global catastrophe. 
because bundled within the belly of the bomber were two 3.8 megaton hydrogen bombs, each containing 200 times the explosive force of Fatman, the nuclear bomb that obliterated Nagasaki. Now, before I get on to what happened next, you might be wondering just what the hell the US Air Force was doing flying hydrogen bombs over home soil. Good question, and I can answer it with just two words. Chrome Dome. Yes, that's a playfully offensive term for a bald man, but it was also the very silly name for a deadly black ops mission run throughout the 1960s by the US Air Force. Chrome Dome was what you might call a doomsday program, created with one simple aim in mind, to intimidate the Soviet state. Remember, this was the middle of the Cold War when nuclear tensions were at an all-time high. World peace relied on a highly sophisticated strategy, inspired by school playgrounds. If you blow me up, I'll blow you up big time. Sounds good on paper, I think, but in practice the whole mutually assured destruction thing had a pretty serious flaw. Namely, that if it ever came to nuclear war, whoever landed the first blow would have one hell of a first mover advantage. Suppose the Soviets were able to destroy or disrupt a significant portion of the United States command infrastructure in a single strike. It could render a retaliatory attack impossible. Hence, destruction was neither mutual nor assured. And that's where Chrome Dome came in. This operation ensured multiple B-52 bombers armed with thermonuclear weapons were in the sky at all times. That way, even if the Soviets bombed North America back to a radioactive Stone Age, the president could still rain fiery death on Russia far from home, all thanks to Chrome Dome. Sure, it was a solid plan, but allow me to paint a precarious epigram. Weapons that could murder millions were being flown over the heads of unwitting civilians. And that happened 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for eight straight years in the 1960s. Sure, flying is one of the safest ways to travel, but put enough aircraft in the sky for long enough, and eventually, fate will deal a fatal fluff. Which brings me neatly back to the 23rd of January, 1961, and our battered bomber plummeting towards the ground alongside two of the most powerful weapons ever built by man. The mighty plane broke apart as it fell, and the nukes were thrown clear. The first drifted slowly down to Earth after its integrated parachute deployed, but the second was speedier, accelerating to 700 miles an hour before smashing into the ground with the force of a meteor. As it happens, only one of the two bombs ever came close to detonating, and it's probably not the one you'd expect. The nukes were equipped with four different safety mechanisms designed to deter incidental detonation. In the case of the second bomb, the one that crashed into a field at close to the speed of sound, these mechanisms worked exactly as intended. As for the first bomb, well, let's just say things played out a little differently. You probably presumed the parachute I mentioned was some kind of safety feature to protect the bomb in the event of an accident, but in reality, it was a key part of the weapon's detonation sequence, designed both to give a pilot time to escape after dropping his payload, and to facilitate an airburst explosion one where the bomb detonates at a set altitude to ensure maximum destruction on the ground below. In other words, the fact that the first nuke's parachute deployed at all was a very ominous sign indeed, because it was preparing to explode. When a bomb disposal team arrived at the site the following day, they found the 3.5 meter, 3,000 kilogram weapon standing perfectly upright and intact, its tip buried in the ground. It was an alarming sight all round. Although admittedly, it was quite a bit better than the alternative, a giant crater of death and fire. 
In the years after the incident, there was plenty of debate as to just how close this weapon had come to exploding. Publicly, the US government played things down, claiming both nukes were deactivated and that there was never any risk to the public. It probably won't surprise you one bit that this was utter bullshit. In 2013, a newly declassified report revealed that three of the four safety mechanisms built into the first bomb had failed and that only an electrical switch in the off position had prevented a firing signal from reaching the nuclear core. In other words, a solitary switch is all that prevented a full-scale detonation. One that would have killed tens of thousands of sleeping Americans in an instant and risked the lives of millions more through nuclear fallout. It's worth pointing out that despite dodging a nuclear apocalypse, the Goldsboro crash was by no means victimless. There were eight servicemen aboard the bomber when it went down eight servicemen, but only six ejector seats. Three of the crew died. Though, remarkably, one of those not in an ejector seat, Lieutenant Adam Mattox, somehow managed to survive by flinging himself out of the plane's top hatch and deploying his parachute. To this day, this big, bald badass remains the only person in history to have bailed out of a B-52 cockpit without an ejector seat and lived to tell the tale. In the days and weeks after this nearest of misses, disposal work commenced. The first bomb that almost murdered thousands proved to be the easiest since it was still in one piece. So they used an incredibly complex atom bomb disposal technique. They picked it up and stuck it on the back of a big lorry, very, very carefully. But things were a bit trickier when it came to the other bomb. Having smashed into a swampy field at a smidge under the speed of sound, the three-ton weapon had burrowed six meters into soft ground, tearing itself apart in the process. The bombs contained two separate nuclear cores apiece to ensure maximum destruction on detonation. The recovery crew quickly located the first and largest of these cores, but the second was never found despite calling in a fleet of industrial excavation vehicles. After weeks of fruitless digging, a decision was made for the hole to be refilled and flattened and basically pretend the whole thing never happened. As you might have guessed by now, that lost core is the little secret I mentioned at the start of this video. To this day, a six kilo rod of weapons grade plutonium lies somewhere underneath those trees. That's why the US Army purchased that particular patch of property, to ensure nobody ever forgot what lies beneath and decided to build a house on it or something else really stupid. Remarkably, the rest of the field is still farmed to this day. What's also remarkably stupid is that the US Air Force was well aware of the issue that brought the bomber down that fateful night. Boeing had figured out that a recent modification they'd made to the wings could, under certain conditions, cause them to literally tear off. I'm no aviation expert, but I think that's pretty serious. The bomber in question had already been booked in for a refit to fix the issue, but apparently the Air Force decided that ferrying nuclear weapons across the Northern Hemisphere was a totally reasonable thing to do in the meantime. And, well, the rest is history. In some ways, you could say this story is a bit of a non-event. I mean, aside from the tragic loss of three crew members, nothing actually happened. And yet, for my money, the Goldsboro incident is one of the most fascinating sliding doors moments in history. A single electrical switch decided the fates not just of millions of Americans, but very possibly the entire world. After all, a 3.8 megaton hydrogen bomb exploding on American soil in the middle of the Cold War could easily have had some dire consequences. If the Americans thought they were under attack, the response would have been immediate and devastating. And even if they realized a nuke was one of their own, would the American government really have admitted to accidentally murdering tens of thousands of its own citizens? 
Or, might JFK, on his first week in the job, remember, have been tempted to point the finger at the old Soviets next door? I guess we'll never know. Thanks for watching.